The next session was actually inspired last year around um, many requests about doing more on communications and social media. And so uh, you'll remember last year we had a social media session, which was well attended. And uh, I thought, why not go to the top? And so we invited Aaron Sherini and the Vice President of Communications and Public Relations, uh, Relations for the foundation uh, to come and join us. And you will see quickly why he is in charge of all things communication. He joined the uh, foundation in 2009 after uh, from the uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation where he was the Managing Director for Public Affairs. Uh, he has a professional background which includes a decade of, as a Foreign Service Officer at the State Department where he served in Ecuador, Armenia, Costa Rica, Colombia, and the Holy See. Um, so he obviously knows the international affairs side of things, he knows the U.S. government side of things, and he definitely knows the U.N. side of things. Um, delighted to work with him, Joe and Renee, who are shared part of the public affairs team at the UN Foundation. Um, he's got a great mechanism, great team, working on behalf of the UN through the foundation's work and all the campaigns and programs, and we're fortunate to be a part of that. You saw earlier today, one of the, the rub-off opportunities for us was having Global Classrooms Decorum PSA being run in Times Square and taxi cabs and so forth. I expect to see more and more of that each year, Aaron. Excellent. So here's Aaron Sherinian. Thank you so much. Patrick, thank you. You know, the key to that introduction, what I learned from that introduction, is that if you want to feel good about yourself, hang around Patrick Madden, <laughs> who will help make sure that you, that you feel good about yourself. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I think this, there's a lot of ballrooms in Washington, D.C., right? There's a lot of meetings going on, probably a lot today. But there is no better meeting and no more important one than the one going on today. I heard it. I was able to spy around the tables. And as Patrick said, what just went on over the last hour was not about the good Italian lunch, but was about the conversation that was happening. This is a really exciting place to be. And let me tell you a story that, for me, confirms this information. A couple of weeks ago, we, the UN Foundation team, working with our campaigns and the UN Association and, and trying to find out how we can make sure that we're helping to tell the story of the UN building friends for the UN and building support for the UN, we sent someone to Africa. We sent someone to Africa to work alongside with WFP, UNESCO, UNHCR. We sent someone with a tape recorder, a video camera, and a laptop computer. And she's a mom. She's a mom blogger. You're going to hear a lot about that today later on. And she, in her readership, probably commands more eyeballs than most journalists who work for the major newspapers that we read every day. She's got a big audience. This woman is a journalist in her own right by training. And I got a call one morning at about 2 in the morning. And when we have teams all over in Africa, I get them all the time. My name is Aaron, A-A-R-O-N. So when your rear end calls someone, most likely you're calling me because I'm at the top of the list. You don't have any friends named Aardvark, so you probably have a friend named Aaron. And I tend to get those calls a lot. So I get a lot of 2 a.m. calls, and sometimes they're important, sometimes they're scary, sometimes they're pretty benign. But this one was a 2 a.m. call, and it started with, Aaron, I can't believe I'm calling you at this hour, but I have to talk to you. I'm here in Tanzania, and why isn't everybody talking about what the UN does? And it was this mom. She took the time to wake me up. She felt so passionate about this. She said, I'm going to tell everybody. Why isn't everybody talking about this? She was all riled up. She was ready to tell the story. She'd seen it firsthand. She's new to the game. You all have been part of this family. You know the UN's work. Some of you may have been to see the work in action in places like Africa. Some of you have seen it in action in New York City. But all of you have that same fervor. And this woman is going to help you help us tell that story. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Some of the tactics we've got, some of what the UN Foundation is doing, working with the UN Association and you and your voices and your members, and how we can all together today refresh some of our skills in talking about the important work of the United Nations. I have very little that I could leave you that you don't already know, but we all need thank you. We all need a refresher course, don't we? Who needs a refresher course here in communications? Thank I'm proud to see that because the best communicators in this room uh, raise their hands, and I know you're all very good at doing this, but we all need a refresher course on how to do that. So let's look at this as a workshop, a chance to interact, a chance to stay awake in the dreaded post-lunch session, which Patrick gave me. But we're going to have a chance to talk a little bit about those, those tactics and what we're doing. 
The first question that we ask everybody when we talk about the UN Association story, the UNA USA story is a great story. You are a great story. The UN's work is a great story. And American support for the UN is a great story. But what does that supporter look like? What's the UN supporter look like? It's a pretty diverse group. And as you know, and as some of us will tell us later on as they share their experiences, a UN supporter can be anybody. It can be this guy. I love this guy. This is little Nate from North Carolina. Some of you have heard me talk about him. Nate is the young Boy Scout who hiked for miles and dedicated his hike to make sure that the United Nations could deliver bed nets to people who needed them. I love that guy. A UN supporter can look like this lady and her girls. What an attractive family. A mom with daughters who know what they're talking about, who care about adolescent girls. A group that was as excited about UN women as any of you in the room. A group that knows how the United Nations can help adolescent girls achieve prosperity for their communities, education for themselves and their family, and how they can make sure that safety, integrity, and respect is at the heart of what the UN is able to help country partners and UN partners achieve around the world. That's what a UN supporter looks like. A UN supporter doesn't have to look like all of us here in the room. That's a key portion of what we like to tell when we're telling the UN story and the story of all of you in the room. What it boils down to is that America cares, and we all know it. I heard that this morning. I heard that in each of your tables that we, I was able to spy on. You all have a message, and you all come to this, this group today with a knowledge that not everyone else in the United States has. America is a country, is a people, is a combination of peoples who cares about what's going on in the world. As basic as that seems, it's at the heart of any good communication about what you're doing, about what the UN can do, and about what we can do together. You all know that this comes with some data. And as you know, we've had the chance to, to use that data and to parlay it as a hard fact with the reporters and the editors and your friends and your communities. Everyone knows about this number, right? What's this number about? Mel said it right off the, did you hear that? Support for the UN. What about support for the UN, Mel? What is it? 86% of American voters support the UN. Did everyone hear that? 86% of voters. We're in a city where some people would go to great lengths to get anything even near that. You all know who I'm talking about. You're going to meet with some of them later on today. But we're in a place where 86% means the facts are on your side. And the reason I wanted to start with this is because in any media training, in any chance that we have to talk to people about how to talk with the press, that understanding and that acknowledgement is key. You are with the winning team. We say this not because it pumps you up and it makes you cocky and it makes you arrogant when you, when you talk with the press, but a firm understanding and a confidence that you're part of the winning movement in America, a winning movement of people who think globally Voters who support the UN is important because it comes across in your message, it comes across in your delivery, and it comes across in what people are going to write. If we as communicators can be firmly rooted in this message of 86%, you have a better chance that your engagement with a reporter is going to find legs, it's going to get printed, and it's going to get moved around in the digital atmosphere that's part of the new media reality today. So we want to make sure that that 86% number is in your mind and comes out of your mouth, more importantly. How many of you had the chance to do something with that polling data when, when the UNA pushed it out around the nation a couple of months ago? Did you, have, did, did you get any reaction from your members? Who got any re reaction from their members? What was the reaction from some of your members? Okay, did you hear that? I thank you. We did not script this, by the way. There was no exchange of $5 bills that happened. Surprise and satisfaction. A nice alliteration, too, by the way. There was some surprise, really. And then that satisfaction that we know that we're part of the, of, of the team. I saw a bunch of you nodding your heads, which tells me that that's maybe what you thought. That's maybe what some of your members thought as well. And that's what the media, that's what the people who are influencers in your community, and that's what the readers who are online in the social media sphere need to hear about, is that surprise and that satisfaction. As you know, part of this means that America needs to be aware that you exist. And that's a key message for us as well, which is why we've helped to, with, the, uh, with programs like the one you saw earlier, where we helped take the Global Classrooms message to Times Square, we think it's important to take this message nationwide. We're partnering with media outlets, 
with communications organizations, with groups that vary from AOL, who is donating us space on almost a monthly basis, to the outdoor advertisers, who when they have free space or blank space, are willing to take our PSAs, are willing to show your pictures, or the pictures of those good-looking global classroom students at the UN, and are willing to get that message out. It's all about repetition and about reminding people, not just in Times Square, but in your hometowns, that you exist, and with repetition, that 86% story will get into the ethos, will get into the understanding that we're part of that winning movement. We will continue to do this, as Patrick put me on the spot in front of all of you to do this year, we're gonna continue to do this to make sure that the nationwide branding of what has to be one of the most proud, storied, and exciting organizations of Americans, who are global thinkers in the world, is out there, is active, and is stronger than ever. Part of doing this makes sure, as you know, that we're talking to the world about UNA. We're talking to the world about UN supporters here in the United Nations, uh, here in the US, and we're talking about how the campaigns of the UN Foundation are helping to build all of this support around the world. The media reality today, and we'll talk a little bit about this later on in the training, the media reality today is that as you look around this map, I decided to put in some of the media outlets that we've spoken to over the past year about you, about the campaigns that we all work on together, and about the work of the UN. It's a pretty good map, right? In none of these is there a quote unquote UN desk. Now with the exception of the New York Times, who you know, but I didn't, you notice I didn't put a dot on New York City there? I did that on purpose. I didn't put a dot on New York City. There is no more UN desk, with the exception of a few very smart friends of ours that we know in New York. But around the world today, and around the country, and in your hometown, I promise, there is no UN beat reporter. It used to exist, they went away. Our job is to engage with members of the press, members of media organizations, who will not look at an issue through a UN lens, but will look at an issue through a health lens, a women's lens, a trends lens, a technology lens, a humanitarian lens. The UN beat is no more. If you pick up the phone, Ginger's nodding to me, which makes me feel good, because I know that, the, that you used to have a UN beat in your area, right, Ginger? It's gone. It's the way of new media. It's the way of the media reality today. So as we talk about talking with the media, I don't want anyone to leave this ballroom today thinking, I gotta go call my UN beat reporter, because you're gonna be calling for a long time, and you'll be on hold for a long time. But the health reporter's there, and we talk to them at Al Jazeera. The women's reporter is there, and we talk to them at The Guardian. The development reporter might even be there. That's really an economics reporter half the time. And they're there at Bloomberg. Sometimes the sustainability reporter is there. Those are the people that we can talk to. Those are the people that we can, can engage with. In your local hometown papers, you are the media story. You're the beat we want to talk about, and we'll, and we'll go into that in just, a, in just a few moments. One of the key principles that undermine, that underpins, rather, underpins everything that we're doing with our messaging, which I want to talk about during this first portion of the, of the conversation, is about making the UN and the UN's message accessible. I'm going to tell you another story. As Patrick mentioned earlier today, I had the great privilege of getting to know you and your organization when I was 14. I lived in uh, Pasadena, California. Proud to be from Pasadena, love Pasadena. Thank you, all three of you who love Pasadena with me. Come on, everyone loves Pasadena, right? We bring you the Rose Bowl. We bring you the Rose Parade, thank you. Uh, um, my, my, my fine hometown, thank you. I was, I was a kid from, from Pasadena, South Pasadena, and a member of my community said, you know, Aaron, you're, you know, I, I was a nerd. I was a nerdy kid. I was interested in the world, though, and someone took the time to say, come to a meeting. And they took me to a UN Association meeting where we talked about, I will never forget, disease. And they talked a little bit about what the UN was doing. There was some discussion of the political moment happening at the UN. But someone put an arm around me and said, you're interesting. You have a big brain, I hope. We, you're at least globally interested. Come and be with us. And it was because the information was accessible for me that I became someone who said, I want to join this organization. Now, I, as of 14, I joined. I'm sure I was on a student membership, and I hope no one goes back into the records and, and asks me for, uh, for uh, retroactive dues, because I had the chance to live all around the world. But I have loved that association with the UNA because the information about the UN was accessible. And that is a key thing that we're trying to do. And all of the resources of the foundation, 
All of our connections with the UN and with our friends are there to help make sure that we can make the information about the UN as accessible as possible. It's got to be approachable, and it's got to be accessible. Because as you know, oftentimes we hear the words when we talk to either a reporter, when we talk to a potential supporter, we hear the words, oh, I'm not a Security Council expert. Have you ever heard that from people? We hear it a lot, and it scares me because I hear it, and I at least know how to engage with that reporter. I'm no Security Council expert, so, so don't talk over me. Don't insult me, but I don't know all that Security Council mumbo jumbo, they will say. What scares me is when people don't say that, because I'm not hearing that from them, and they're thinking that the UN is way over their head. So all of the information that we try to produce, that we try to make accessible for people, it's never about dumbing down the most important mission in the world. It's never about that. It's always about making the information approachable and accessible. Just because you know about these issues doesn't mean that someone else shouldn't have the opportunity to learn more. One of the things that we've been trying to do over the last year that we are willing to share with you and that you have in your toolkits is we've been looking at infographics which is a tool that you have available, which is a great leave behind for your local newspaper. I hope that all of you are using these. We're taking the data that the UN produces on a weekly basis, a rich source of, UN, of, of data. There couldn't be a better source than the UN. We're taking this information, and this, the one I've shown you here talks about a woman's life around the world every day. Breaks down for, just to give you a snapshot, what she wants in terms of protection for her family, what she wants in terms of the adolescent girls in her life and in her village, breaking down with data pictures that show how this is an issue that everyone can be part of and that tells the story of the UN's great work to help with women around the world and the realities that they face. This is not a new science. USA Today invented this over a decade ago. And infographics are increasingly becoming important conversation starters with the media. Many of you saw this, uh, this infographic, which was our most successful to date this year, that outlines what it is that the UN does on a daily basis. Every day, this is what the UN does. Did all of you see this? Okay, some of you are raising, raising your hands. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do the opposite thing because Joe and Renee are here. Who didn't see this? Okay, we're gonna come find you because we want you to have this. And there are people who live in your city who will want to have this. Some of them are your members, all of them are your members. But some of them also are those reporters that you've tried to talk to and you've banged on their door over and over again. They've never written anything. Please send this to them. It's a conversation starter. It might build the foundation for some concrete data about what the UN does around the world every day. This, by the way, was taken from, the, uh, from UN sources. And if I may share, since I think we're off the record here, ish-esque today, uh, we were very pleased that the UN thanked us for this initiative and also took this information and integrated it into its public information that it's using this year, which is a great symbol of the partnership that we enjoy with, with, uh, with the UN communicators. So approachability and accessibility, which brings us to the fact that if you don't have the information, you can't share it. We're going to talk a little bit today about some techniques about sharing information. Patrick out, uh, unveiled the new interdependence site today, which I think is one of the smartest tools we've got out there to show people that these issues are relevant and approachable. I put up an example of UN Wire just to remind you that every day there's something happening around the world where the UN is getting reported on. There is UN news out there. Sometimes it's not easy for you to find, sometimes it's not easy for us to find, but we do a scrub every day and between the interdependence great reporting, UN dispatches interesting analysis, and reporting that's going on around the world, there is a place where Monday through Friday at minimum, you can find news and views about something that touches the UN, your work in a place where the UN story is being told, advocacy, and how the campaigns around the world are helping to build a movement in support of the UN. These are, these are information sources that are now available on the UNA website and on the interdependent. So there is a daily news source. Again, it's not always easy to find, but it is always available now and to you. UN Wire being just one, um, just one example of that. I wanted to, before moving ahead, uh, remind that these principles of what, of, of the foundation of how we build our communications approach and what we've been doing over the last year and what we'll be doing before is based on going to where people are. You know as well as anyone that if you want to be a good communicator, you have to be communicating with people where they currently stand. Where are people getting their news and information today in America? 
Someone said it. I heard it. Who said it? Speak up. The inter who, who said that? Thank you. The internet, true or false? Absolutely true. More people are getting their news from the internet, or at least starting to get their news from the internet, than ever before. That's the majority of people. But by the way, the news organizations are also getting their news from the internet. But what particular device is the place where people are getting their news and information? Is this funny? We are so fickle as a people. Pew told us last year that when it comes to news, we would, 65% of us at least, we would sooner ditch our television than ditch our phone as a news source. That's 2011 data, that's from Pew, and that's about engaged adult citizens in the US. You would sooner throw out your TV than ever have to throw out this as a news source, not as your phone, but as a news source. The foundation believes that this is important because you, with members all around the United States, have the need to make sure that people are informed where they're getting their news and doing it on a daily basis. So one tool I want to make sure that you're aware of is that we too are helping the UN, helping each of you, trying to listen and getting that news and information onto your phone. The websites that Patrick unveiled earlier today are accessible and, and are friendly with, the web, with, uh, with your cell phone. But at the same time, we want to make sure that you can use this device and that your members know that they have a tool, they have a tactic, they have something that they can use as part of their membership in UNA, as part of being, as being part of the UN Foundation family, to receive news on their phone every day. So I'm gonna do an experiment. Joe and Renee, are you ready? Are you ready to be deployed around the room? Okay, we're gonna do an experiment today here. Are you ready for it? Yeah. It's after lunch, so get ready. How many of you have your phones on you? Come on, put them up in the air. Almost like we're at a concert. Okay, put your phones up in the air. If you've got your phone, I want to know, how, are any of you currently getting UN news or UN Foundation updates or UNA news from your phone? A couple of you said yes, I'm glad. How are you getting it? Through email, good. How, who else is getting it from another way? Text. Yasha, what did you say? Text. Yasha is getting the text. You as members of the UN Foundation family, you as proud members of the UN Association of the US of A, can get a daily text on your phone. It's free of charge, and if it's not free, please send me the bill, care of Patrick Madden. <laughs> uh, it's a free service to you and your members. So if you have a phone, all you need to do is the following. How many of you use your phone to text somebody? Yeah. I don't do it as much as others, thank you. Young people do it up to 50 times a day. I, don't, I no longer find myself in that category. But if you text the letters UNF to this number, every day you're gonna get an, a link to a news source or an update or a piece of UN information where we can be great advocates for the UN. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Coming up to the Rio Plus 20 Summit, you know that the UN is calling on governments and people everywhere to take action. We don't know exactly what will come out of it, but we know they're gonna need us to activate our networks. We will be able to text to thousands of people an update that says, did you know UN General Secretary General Ban Ki-moon asked the world to know about the following link? Did you know that in Kentucky, the UN Association was able to head off something very important, and we can put the link into what happened with Agenda 21? Or did you see this great article that came out of Southern California about the importance of the UN in people's daily lives? We can do that. If you have the ability to text the letters UNF to 80676, you're gonna get that update every day. And if you don't, or if you have problems with it, because my phone was a little bit tricky on it at first, raise your hands and Renee or Joe can come and find you during this presentation or after, and they're gonna help you do that. Again, we need to go to share the messaging, to share the news to where people are. We know that Americans, and that means 63% of your chapter members are also using their phones for news, and we wanna make sure that we're there as well. This is not about being tricky or trendy, it's a matter of how people get their news today. One of the key things that we're all doing together then is to helping to build, so let me, let, me, let me close that off real quick. Is anyone having a problem doing that? If you do, you can raise your hands and Renee or Joe will come help you after. Do you see Renee and Joe? Because they're gonna come find you. You're gonna get a text almost every day. It's different though. So you have to know what you're signing up for. You're, just, you're signing up for a reminder, well, almost Monday through Friday at least, on something you can do. So some of you are finding Renee and Joe, this is great. In building this next UN press corps, we know it starts in your hometown. And we want to make sure that the people that you talk to on a daily basis from your media outlets feel that they're part of that UN press corps. Because it's not going to be rebuilt in New York City. It's definitely not going to be built anywhere else around the world. Budgets are tight, and newsrooms are closing their international leads. 
So what we've been doing, and many of you have been a part of this by nominating journalists from your area, is we have been activating local journalists to come to the UN and get direct access to UN leaders. Here you see four pictures, four different slides, where we've been able to, to, to cherry pick journalists who are interested, whose bosses would let them go for a couple of days, and who can be part of one of the six or seven yearly press fellowships that we as a foundation have been happy to support on different levels. Because again, we know that no editor is gonna wake up in the morning and say, gosh, I really want you to go to New York City and learn more about what the UN is doing, or I really want you to fly to Geneva and learn more about the WHO's important work, no. But if we can offer it, if we can find the resources to get some people a plane ticket over, we can get them access to important leaders and people who will build that cadre of knowledge. I wanna be honest with you, this doesn't always result in a news article in your hometown paper, it doesn't. But I'll tell you a story about what it does do. We had a, uh, a press fellow who was a great contact of ours, who we were able to connect with some direct UN leaders Nothing ever came out of it. Not a single article. Not a single bit of ink. But we were so happy when we got the email saying, hey, I've just been asked to go over to Vanity Fair where I'm gonna be an editor. That was a good investment for us. And he's writing. And it's important he came from a more local source and he's now part of that next UN press corps. I say this to you again so that you know that we, as part of a family together, are trying to put together these resources. And when you know of a star local journalist who you think would be great for one of these, we want you to let Joe know. We want to make sure that we can activate those people when opportunities come up. It's hard to scramble at the last minute, but if you're talking with somebody that you know is good and would be a good resource, they know you, they know the local story in the Mid-Atlantic region or in the Southern States, but they might need some more help to get to know the UN story, let us know, and we can help put them in, in, in part of that process. Here again, you'll see a, a group of influential people that we talked about earlier, the moms. My colleague, Debbie, is gonna talk to you a little bit more about how we view bloggers, influential people who post on their sites around the world. Because we know that one of the important parts about communications today is engaging that digital generation. The next generation of people who would be engaged about the UN if they knew how to get the information, who generally support its principles, and who wanna be part of it. As part of a yearly exercise, we are, we are bringing together digital leaders or influencers. These are people who have blogs or online journals that total well over some of the newspapers that we're reading around the world. That's just the reality. There are people around the world who get to more readers than most newspapers. Here we bring them around, uh, around the table every year around the UN General Assembly, where every year we've been happy to have agency heads from UN Women, WFP, WHO, UNICEF come together and talk with people who would never be part of a UN press corps briefing, who would never fit in that small room for 10 to 15 people, but would love to get access and have been introduced to UN issues. We're continuing to engage that digital generation. We'll do so around the Real Plus 20 Summit. We'll do so around every major UN opportunity where we think it's in our interest that the tent be broadened and that the table be expanded so that people who are not global issues writers are part of this. Again, we'll talk a little bit later on about an initiative we're, we're hosting around the Real Plus 20 Summit, and I was thrilled to get Ginger's article that she's already talking about this. The fact that everyone can be involved in a summit meeting, everyone can support the UN, and around Real Plus 20, we're doing that with social media leaders, and I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit later on during the presentation today. So let's talk about our message, because it's the most important thing that we're gonna do when we talk to a journalist, and we're gonna practice how we talk to a journalist today. What is our message? What is it that we are trying to get across in talking about you, our work, and the United Nations? I'm gonna share with you what have been our most successful messages in talking to the media over the last year. I'm not prescribing these as our messages because we're gonna hear from you about what your most influential messages have been, but I want you to know what has gotten our foot in the door and what has gotten us through to talk to members of the media out of DC, New York, LA, and around the world. So with your permission, I'm gonna talk about those messages and then we'll practice some of it as well. One of the most successful messages that we've used to date that has been a conversation starter is this one. It's more important than ever to support the United Nations. This is the urgency message. It happens in two different ways. There's the urgency message, the world's fallen apart, it's never been more important. And then there's the possibility message. There's more you can do today to support the UN than ever before. This is the message that is a, a is a message that we say is a constant drumbeat. It needs to be reiterated over 
and over and over again so that someone can repeat, aha, there is a group out there that thinks it's more important than ever to support the UN. It can never be a foregone conclusion, and you can never say to yourself, they've already heard this from me. This is the principal, fundamental, foundational message that we have to repeat over and over again. I can, I'm sure that my colleague, Ms. Sorensen, can tell me that there's never enough that you can say with this, uh, when it comes to this message. It has to be repeated with every audience and every occasion. The second message that seems to give people but there's a little bit of surprise, a little bit of satisfaction, sometimes shock, is that we, together, are part of the largest network of UN supporters in UN history. Someone challenged me on that. Do you believe that? Wow, that doesn't seem like a very enthusiastic group. I was, I was expecting to hear a lot of amens and yes. We are part of the largest network of UN supporters in UN history. Why? Let's do the math together. The dem what about the demographics? There are more people, good for you. So the basic principle on math, I love that. Excellent, well done. There's just more people, so there's more of us. Good for you. But would we rely on this as a fundamental message if we were playing math games like that? Not yet. What about all of us here together? How's the organization doing, Patrick? Thumbs up from Patrick. We've never been stronger as a group. We as part of the entire group of the people who support the whole UN Foundation family of campaigns. The networks that we belong to, WAFUNA, the World, the World Federation of, of uh, of UN associations around the world. That's a, a, a family outside of the US borders. But there's never been a larger group of people who support the UN ever. And that 86% number is part of that. You had your hand up, sir. 86%. 86%. So more of us, to a greater majority, they're now part of a larger network that even know how to be part of us. It's never been easier to find out how to be part of the UN Association's movement, because that's what you are, a movement of people who advocate on behalf of the UN who are informed and engaged. This point is another point that some people take as a foregone conclusion. Well, of course people know that. No, people do not know that. The assumption oftentimes is the opposite. The truth is there's never been such a large network of supporters. The map, I love this map, and I, and I uh, recycled the map from 2011 from UN Day. I know this is not fully, fully accurate because there's a couple of blue dots that should be on there. Doesn't that map show you that simultaneously in one day, there were very few communities that weren't representative. Maybe there should be some more that, that will be represented in the future. Maybe a couple uh, fell off that map. But that is a pretty much a UN blue map to me. That shows that when people say, nah, America really doesn't care about the UN, they're wrong. The key message for us, a majority of those Americans care about the UN and support its work, so we already did that in the 86%. You've kind of become my Mr. 86% now in the room. I'm gonna to point to you every time I talk about 86%. But the second part of the message is so should you, is the advocacy message, is the supporter message that we wanna make sure people are aware of, and that everyone can play a role in supporting the UN. You do not have to be a conflict resolution expert or a UN human rights PhD who spent time in Somalia this year to support the work of the UN. Unfortunately, some people view UN issues and think, oh, I'm just not smart enough to talk about it. I'm just not an expert in those issues. And so they detach themselves. That's a danger for us. We cannot afford to let that happen. People need to know that it's approachable, it's accessible, and that you can also play a role in supporting the UN. You do not to have, you do not, it's not necessary that you ever have met <coughs> Boutros Boutros Ghali to be a UN supporter, or know exactly what Kofi Annan achieved, or what Ban Ki-moon's gonna do in Rio. We can get you that information easily, and we can connect you with people who can inform you if you want to know, but that's not a threshold that should ever keep anyone out of being a supporter of the UN. So when we talk about media, I put up this slide to, to remind each of you why we believe that you are the key media champions for your organization. You are the spokesperson. You are the person who brings the UN Association to life, you're the reason the story is interesting, and with all due respect to my colleagues in Washington, D.C. and the leadership of your organization, we're not, the, we're not the juicy stuff. We're not the reason that we'll ever get ink in any of your newspapers. It's really never about us. You are three things here. The media, we know, can be a significant amplifier. Why, why we use the media? The media is a significant amplifier. It's a credible source, and it's a powerful driver in support for the UN. Let's talk about those one, two, and three. We know that media gets the word out. We know that if you're not using the media, you, may, you can talk to yourself or you can go to the corner cafe all you want. No one's gonna ever hear your message. So it's an amplifier. I think that's, a, that's something that a lot of people understand. But media is a credible source. 
We're going through a crisis in the United States right now. Sometimes people in America are trusting their nightly news less and less, and even though they're using that Yahoo News article or that AOL News article or that CNN News alert, they're trusting it a little bit less than before, but you still believe that at least what you read in the news is something you should know about. You might not agree with all the data, you might dig into it a little bit more, but you at least know that if it's on the news, it's important enough for me to care about. So the media still is a credible source for all Americans. And then the media we know is a powerful driver in support for the UN. So Ginger, can I embarrass you for a minute? Ginger passed me right before this started, just two seconds before, right? What equates to me as gold bullion in the form of this eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. This is an article that uh, appeared in the Rivertown Enterprise, right? How many people read the Rivertown Enterprise? Let's be honest. Oh, she knows. Oh, you read it, good, one. One person reads the Rivertown. How, about how many people read the Rivertown Enterprise? Let's be honest with each other. We're off the record. Well, we have maybe, there might be 530,000 people. Okay, maybe. Okay, so did you hear that? That's a very, this is, these are good media metrics, especially as media, the traditional media's work. 30,000 people get this. That means they either pay for it, or it finds its way into their corner cafe, or into a bathroom, we don't know, right? But at least 30,000 people get the Rivertown Enterprise. That's, that's significant. 5,000 people actually read it, and there's an estimation that probably, I would imagine, 6,500 or so are getting it through what we call pass around. That means Mel gets it and he sends a clipping to his you know, brother or something. So that's significant. But when this article comes out, the UN Association can share it among its members. The UN Foundation can make sure it gets highlighted on UN Wire. And before you know it, this Rivertown Enterprise article, we can claim, has been seen by hundreds of thousands of people. And we're gonna march this puppy, you know right where. Right up to an office on Capitol Hill that says people are aware of how Rivertown Enterprise readers care about the UN's work with sustainability and development. That's the new media opportunity that we live in today. I love this. We love hometown newspapers. There is no more valuable resource for us than hometown newspapers, but we would be fools if we let it sit with the couple of thousand people that read the Rivertown Enterprise. Its value, and the reason it became gold bullion for me, is because we're gonna make sure that we share it with those people and then claim to our key audience, the people who can make or break budgets and perceptions about the UN that hundreds of thousands of people are seeing it. You know the game. And that's part of the, the, the value of being part of this family, is that we can highlight this work and we can share it and we can move it ahead. Now why you? You're a good looking group, but we could go to better looking people. They exist, that's why they invented Hollywood, right? Why would we say that you are our spokespeople? Because you are passionate, you're authentic, you actually got on a plane or a train or a bus to get here. You're active and connected in your community. You know more about the politics of your community than anyone does. And you're proof that the movement is real and proof that the movement is growing. That's the reason that we believe that you are the best people to tell the story of UN, the UN support, and why it's important in the lives of, of Americans everywhere. The media landscape is changing. We're gonna spend some time today not talking about all of these, but I wanted to let you know how we are grouping out and on my work with Joe and Renee, how we always think about these different baskets of the media. There's a, and there's some of you who are here who are experts in it. Some of you who are in front of cameras every day, you know who you are, who are really good at doing this. So this is basic for a lot of you. But there's earned media, media that you earned. Some reporter came to you, you didn't pay him a penny, and you got a story. There's owned media, which can be media on your websites, your social media feed, your Twitter feed, your Facebook page. That's owned media, you own it. You are the Ted Turners of your day because you own media enterprises. Sometimes hundreds or thousands of people read it, and sometimes we can get it to even more. And there's paid media, media that you went out and bought an advertisement for, or for an event, or you actually purchased some. And then it, of course, dissects itself into broadcast on TV, print, and the important social digital media that is the reality of our day. And as we're reaching out to local media, and here's where the refresher course comes in. You all know, and you've been part of interviews, but each of the three steps is vital to remember. That you know who your audience is, that you tailor and hone your message, and that you recap and follow up. I wake up in the morning and I go to bed at night thinking about how we're communicating. And what worries me the most is that third one. 
And I'm being honest with you about it because I need your help. As, as, as members of the same family, members of the same army, I think we need to work on number three a little bit. Let me tell you why. You know your audience very well. I think you tailor and hone your message as well. But how many times do you follow up with someone that you went out and engaged with in the media? It's tough to do, right? Because reporters will tell you, reporters are special people. They believe they're the busiest and most important people in the world. They really do. Are they? Well, in that moment, they might be for you. But the recap and the follow up is an important step that we as people, we as communicators, and you as spokespeople can do a better job at. I know that from the Foundation Family's perspective, it takes us 10 op-ed attempts to get one op-ed placed. That's just the reality. We have to send and beg and ask 10 times to get one of those op-eds in there, which is why every time I see one of your op-eds, I know what you put into it. Now, you might not have 10 newspapers to choose from in your local hometown, but it's probably gonna take you a, a number of attempts to say, hey, did you see this issue? Why aren't you reporting on the food crisis in, in the Sahel? What about the UN's work to support uh, women around the world? You've got to do the recap and the follow-up, and we all can be doing a better job of that. So we welcome your ideas, lessons learned, and successes in how to do the recap and follow-up. I'd like to ask for some, some examples. I'm gonna put my, my uh, friends on the spot here. I'm gonna put Joe and Renee on the spot. Joe, what's a way that you can follow up with the media in a way that they're not gonna get defensive or aggressive? Come on up and use a mic, use a mic. Joe has to do this all the time. So can you give us an example of how you can follow up with the media so that you're gonna avoid getting a door slammed in your face? Um, send a quick email, you know, did, did this happen in your community? Conference. Um, I know you couldn't come, or you couldn't, um, uh, you know, cover the story this time. But we're going to be here next year. We'd love to have you have you over, or a quick quick message. Uh, my phone is great too. Did, did you hear the words that Joe said? By the way, we did not rehearse this. Did you hear that Joe said, "Just in case you missed it," which I love. It's one of my favorite phrases ever. What was Joe really saying when he said, "Just in case you missed it"? I know you missed it. You definitely missed it. I am sure you didn't see this. That is our value as a UNA, to remind the members of the media around us, I know you missed this. I'm not gonna be rude to you. I'm not gonna talk down to you. But you have the most elegant of reasons to get your foot in that door and say, just in case you missed this, I want you to have it. Because the journalist, the editor, the owner of your local paper wants to be the smartest guy or gal at the cocktail party. They're never gonna say, oh no, don't tell me because I, want, I don't wanna know anymore. They might file it away. They might not read past paragraph one. But just in case you missed it is a golden tactic that we all should be using. I see around the table, how many people are here today? 150 plus, right? There are 150 just in case you missed it emails that should be going out after you're here in Washington. Not sure if you heard, but I was in DC this last week. I'm sure they didn't hear that. But you have the opportunity to engage with your local media with that. And the second thing Joe said, thank you Joe. The second thing that Joe said that I really liked is, we noticed you couldn't be here this year. You couldn't attend our event on Women's Day this year. You weren't there for our UN Day event this year, but we look forward to having you next year. What does it do? It's a basic tactic. It's good social skill, but it's putting it on the map. You exist. You're not a, a uh, you know, this was not a one-time thing in your community. Your UNA chapter is there. It's there to stay. It's got a proud legacy, and it's going to be there again next time, and you're going to be hearing from me. So I'd ask for your help in recapping and following up because we know that that investment works. And the more that we go back to the media in this day and age, especially where people are bombarded with releases. One journalist told us the other day that they get upwards of 350 press releases or suggestions for stories a day. We have two choices. We can step back and say, I don't want to crowd your inbox, or we can try to win the Google war. And we're going to win the war. And we're going to do that by continuing to be graceful and kind and just doing a quick wanted to make sure you saw this, or heaven forbid, the all-important telephone call. Don't be afraid to pick up that phone and follow up. Most important is when something does come out in the media. Agree with it or not, the most important thing for you to do is to acknowledge that you saw it and open up a dialogue. Noticed your article. Noticed your article on the UN's work in Syria. Was interested in reading your analysis. Now you might be thinking, ugh, dummy. You totally got it wrong. Retort where you need to, but open up the dialogue to say, I hope you saw this analysis on our website, or would love to put you in touch with someone if you should ever want to know what Americans, who are your readers, think about it. Just make the offer. No one worth their salt in journalism is going to delete that email. They see you as a source, 
They see you as a person to go back to in the future. And more importantly, they see you as a way that their article is going to be more interesting than the next guy's. So when you see something about the UN's work, especially if it's showing up in the Rivertown Enterprise, and if it didn't mention you, or maybe if it did, follow up. I saw your article. Thanks for putting UN issues in front of our readers. Next time, let me know how I can be of service to you. The mega messages, the big messages that have been the most successful have been these that we talked about today. And I'm repeating them for you for a couple of reasons. I told you you needed to repeat them, so I'm repeating them to you. And I want to put them out there because we'd like to hear from you what have been the most successful messages when working with the media in your regions. Americans support the UN. The reality is they do. How many, what percentage of American voters again? 86%. That was so un underwhelming. How many Americans? 86%. 86% of American voters. Oh, gee, people in Congress would do cartwheels for that, for that approval rating. 86% of American voters support the UN. The UN is a good deal for the US. And the UN enables countries around the world to come together and share the burden in solving pressing problems. This has been a very successful trio of messages that you've used in your chapters in your local areas over the last year. Let's talk about number two for a minute. The UN is a good deal for the US. I put it in quotes there so we could discuss it. What does that mean? What are we saying with that message? Where, where am I going with that message? And why have you found it successful when we've seen your stuff? Gillian, please use that mic. Uh, yes, the UN is a good deal for the US. It serves not just the global interest, but our national interest, our safety and security, our prosperity, our health, our ability to travel and invest and, and, and go back and forth abroad. Uh, and beyond that, it is uh, a dollar well spent. The investment is small and the return is very great. It also gives us a unique opportunity to lead and to connect and to build the partnerships and coalitions that, uh, uh, that, that build consensus and make things happen. It allows us to lower our profile just a bit and to work with others, collaborate, cooperate, whatever, and to use the UN setting uh, in that way. Does she know what she's talking about? She does, give her a hand. The US is, the US is a good deal, and I'm gonna show you a resource here if I can get this technology to work here. I want to show you this resource. It's in your toolkit. Oh, guess not. Uh, technology's not going to work for me today, guys. Sorry. But I'm going to, because um, we're out of memory, whatever that means. I'm going to um, remind you that in your toolkit, we have data. The data's on your side that shows that for every dollar invested, that every dollar that the UN invests into the US, there's an economic impact, not only for the good of humankind, not only for the good of the world, not only for all of the reasons that Gillian put out there, but I'm gonna get very basic, mundane, and banal with you for a minute. For every dollar that the US spends, there's an economic impact that's positive for the US economy. You know who I'm talking to right now? I'm talking to those guys who are saying, don't talk to me about anything global. It's all about what happens in my pocketbook. It's not what happens from the pulpit in New York. Those people you have data for as well. For every dollar spent, the US government spends into the UN system. There is an economic benefit to the US. What is it? Does anyone recall this? Maybe this is even more fun as a test. Oh, I would have been a horrible elementary school teacher. I would have been so mean. $1.56, you even got it to the penny. I say $1.60, right? Sue me if I get it wrong. I say $1.60. I'm gonna round you up a little bit if we're on the prices right. $1.56, $1.60 you can use is the economic benefit just to the US. So even beyond the important reasons that were mentioned just now. There's even an economic benefit for the people who just want to talk dollars and cents with you. That data is in your toolkit. It's in your little flash drive. It's easy to read. It's in sound bites. And we want you to digest that information. We want you to be ready for when someone, this is not about politics, but for when someone in your district during this election period says, why should I waste money down the, ugh, I hate hearing this word. Why should I waste money down that rat hole? And you're all, that really got a lot of you going. So I know you hear this. And you say, guess what? It's important, and you start with these reasons, it's important for the world, it's a good deal for the US, but a buck 60 is coming back to our economy. Why would we take something back that's that good of an investment? I don't know how your 401ks work, but I would like to have that kind of an ROI on my investments. It's good for the world, it's good for humanity, it's good for tomorrow, and it's good economic sense. The third piece that's up here, that the UN enables countries around the world to come together and share the burden, I think Gillian mentioned that, and that's been an important message that we've seen each of you use. What I'd like to do for the next couple of minutes is, I'm gonna turn the time back to the real genius in the room, which is your tables. I'd like to ask for you, before we do some role playing uh, in, in a couple of seconds, 
to come together and find out or identify and then tell us what has been the most successful message you've used with the press in your area, in your local area. So I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes, I'm gonna be super mean about it, I will call time, and then we'll come back and we'll do some tactics with talking to the press, okay? So share among yourselves, and then we're gonna ask you what has been the most successful message in your district or area that you've used with the press. Go ahead. Okay, we're going to come back in a couple of seconds, folks. All right, let's come on back now and find out what was the most successful message that you've been using recently in your districts. And while we're doing that, Joe, could you come up here and help me pull out that slide that you were gonna help me with earlier? Thanks, we'll do that real quick. All right, so what's, what's been the most successful message that you've gotten? I'm not sure who's in what region, so you're gonna have to identify for me what your region is. For some reason, I haven't heard a lot from New England. Here they, here they founded our country and I haven't heard from them. Does anyone on this side of the room wanna to talk to us? What's been the most successful message you've used? Come on, I need a hand. Yes, ma'am. Use that mic, use your voice. My name is Audrey and I'm with the Columbus, Ohio chapter yeah. and the uh, most relevant message that we have is that we let the UN know that um, even though they think of it as a global perspective but we tie it into always something that's local to have that impact because we always get the argument of what's going on over there and we tie it in to let them know that it's going on here. It's all about what happens in Columbus. Did you hear, I was, I was hoping we'd get there and we could start with from the, from, the very, from the very stop message. One of the most important messages you're gonna use is that it matters to Columbus. It matters to where you're living. Thank you. Mel. We had a very quiet table. Uh, we had Gillian and Catherine <laughs> and, and Larry Levine. I'm sure and, no uh, one's Levine. And, uh, but our, Mel Boynton I'm from Southern California, our, our local chapter president is right over here, Katie Garricky, uh, forwards those advocacy messages to, as letters to the editor with a personal twist. And those have been very successful at getting uh, the UN message uh, on the uh, page two of our local newspaper, which is the letters from readers. Right, so the advocacy message that we care, hear us roar, we're not being quiet about these things, we're, we're advocating and we're talking to you. Thank you, Mel. Let's go over here. I'm from the Center County, Pennsylvania chapter and also with an area council of organizations and our message is working with us gives you an opportunity to have a personal impact on international issues. 
personal impact on the world. Thank you, which people crave for right now. Good. Let's go. Where are we now? I feel like we need to go back and forth. There's a little bit of Oprah going on here. Let's go here. Yeah. Isabel Robertson from Sacramento. Yep. And what happens in Sacramento? What's the message that's working? We don't have much left, but I've come up here to ask one more, a separate thing. Yeah. When all our tables got moved, yeah. my purse disappeared. Oh, good for you. Now here's someone who's using her message. I've been outside, and I've looked under tables. What's this purse look like? It's uh, about this big, and it has colored pink as leather. Brown, gold, it's in stripes, leather stripes. Pink, brown, and gold. I like this woman because she's using her mic and she's taking advantage of a, of a message, right? <laughs> Find this Sacramento purse. <laughs> Let's get it back there. Thank you. Very well done. Thank you. Well done, right? Thank you. Did we find it? Did we already find it? No, not yet. Okay, keep us posted, would you? Report back. All right, let's go here. What's your message? Thank you. We're going to find this purse for you. Uh, David Stillman, uh, Mid-Atlantic Region. And uh, the most successful messages that we have found are several. One is to uh, identify with something that the reporter is interested in, in their, in their own life and work. Uh, another is to become known as a source for, for finding information uh, that uh, they otherwise might not be able to dig up. Can I, can I rephrase that? You have a local source in your UNA on UN information. Am I, am I stating yeah. that correctly? Good, yeah. keep going, I love yeah. that, keep going. And, and the third one is to uh, take advantage of uh, UN Day celebrations to focus on something that is popular in the local area, like uh, in, in Queens, New York, uh, anything about children will get reported. So, okay. so, so the that. UN is about what Matt, what's popular for you. The UN is about children. The UN is about health. The UN is about what's popular. Good. Let's keep going here. We're going to cut off the line here because I'm so happy we have so many. But let's hear what's Joe, your message. Uh, Joe Baxter, uh, Connecticut, uh, local newspaper, 30,000 people. Anything anyone is related to in, in the local area um, and wants to connect the UN, they'll publish it. Op-ed, uh, visit to South Korea, anything you can connect that you are involved with with the UN as a member of the community and you present, they'll put it in. Okay, so did we hear the thread with my colleague from Columbus earlier? Again, the fact that you have someone from, remind me your home is from where in Connecticut? Litchfield County. Litchfield County, Connecticut. Litchfield County, and are you a Litchfielder? Where are you from, Litchfield? Litch, Litchfielder, is that what you call it? You're a Kentian? What do you call people from Kent? A Kentonian? I don't know. A Kenter. Local Kenter goes to DC to talk about global issues. That's an Akentite. That's an important message. And that's always, that's the Columbus message that's always going to be important. Let's hear from you three colleagues and then we'll move ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Dick Blagney, Seattle, Pacific Northwest. We had the most successful article yesterday. Yeah. On Friday night, we had a speaker who was uh, Richard Falk, who is the UN Special Rapporteur yep. for the Palestinians. Uh, he was speaking, he spoke on Friday night, as I said. Um, we, we, we tried to get an interest. The, I had a phone call from the uh, assistant uh, managing editor, and he said, how can we talk with Richard Falk? Well, it turned out then that they had a, a reporter call him at his home. Uh, and, and so they got the story before he spoke but it resulted yesterday in a full column uh, article that was excellent, superb. Did, the can I ask best a question? we've had. Did, did, the, did the article mention your chapter at all? It did not, okay. with regret. Is that, no, I don't want you to regret it. That's why I was trying to catch you first. Is that a problem? Not really. Not because really. it showed up in whose home paper? Seattle, yes. Your local chapter. Yes. So even, I don't want you to see it as a failure because you get to prove to your representative and to other members of the media that you talk to that readers do care in your district. It would have been great had it mentioned that you convened him, right? Yes. But it is, it is absolutely a success that you were successful in helping to get the UN's work and the message into your local paper. That proves to me that there's an editor in Seattle who knows his market well enough, can smell out what the readers want, and who knew that that, era, that fault message was, was going to be interesting. So it's good the, for you. Thank you. It's the best story we've had in over 10 years. Well done. Bravo, sir. Let's hear it. Let's give, let's give our colleague a hand, right? A little bit of love for Seattle. Thank you. All right. So what's yours? All right, so off of Think Locally and also uh, off of politics, we, we have congressional forums. So we, we interview right. the candidates and it's something that gets, gets out in the community. And, and then, you know, in terms of follow-up, you can call that local reporter who covers that campaign and remind them throughout the campaign of what these issues are that are related to the UN. Isn't that interesting? You're going to have, you're able to smoke out 
the best targets for your media outreach this year because of the campaign. The campaign is a huge opportunity because at one point foreign policy is gonna come up in the campaigns. I, have you met a politician that doesn't like publicity? I have yet to meet them. And you're gonna be able to smoke out those folks. Well done, thank you for that. And your suggestion. Uh, yes, in Milwaukee we also had a congressional forum, but uh, all of our congressional uh, leaders had to go back to, for a vote, so it wasn't quite as successful as we thought it would be, but it's worth doing again. <laughs> uh, and in 2005, to uh, inform the city of Milwaukee about the Millennium Development Goals, we had a really giant successful conference about uh, the Millennium Development Goals, and our chapter then adopted, uh, we, we p would put a presentation on each uh, of the uh, Millennium Development Goals uh, from then on, or at least until 20, uh, what is it, 2010? So, so I'm hearing that the message is, because I wanna, I, I, I wanna, I'm gonna put, put a message to this. The message is that, where's home for you again, Milwaukee? Milwaukee. That Milwaukee, that you're a convener where global issues are being discussed in Milwaukee. I'm hearing mm -hmm. that through the MDG conference, through the, through the candidate forums, that you're having the ability to convene. Yes, and we also have funded a annual UN Day uh, talk at Rotary International right, in good. Milwaukee, and then at the university as well. Excellent. Let's hear what your message is. Thank you for sharing, and then we'll, and then we'll conclude this part and go to some training. Yes. Did we find the purse, by the way? Not yet, we're on it, we'll get the purse, yes. We're from the East Bay, and yes, two parts to the message. There are times when the United Nations is headlined for doing something badly, what yes. Kofi Annan has yes. been doing, yes. and so on. Uh, be prepared to answer questions on that. We had a street fair in Berkeley um, last week, and there was two, two different street fairs, one north, one south. We covered both. We had this petition ready to sign. It goes to our senators, and it goes to our members of the House who don't ratify treaties, but it's asking for ratification. Out of this, one of the treaties is the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So we decided to try that out on passers-by and said, what do you think? Should the child be better protected? Should the United States take part in that? And then you point out that the US is the only country not to have ratified this treaty on the rights of the child. We got more signatures. I'm saying we pulled out something that is of, of interest and of, of, uh, of interest at that moment. Something that's in the news currently. Six because months from now, we'll do a different issue. Good, because it's not gonna be the same issue. So it's but, women and children. But let's take, let's take that point, the point that you raised about we are the best friends of an organization that is perfect. An organization, I mean, you, none of you were saying no, none of you were saying yes, we all know the reality. We're the best friends of an organization with a global mandate that is a big mandate. And there's the reality of the fact that there will be in the news moments where there will be incorrect and potentially sometimes correct allegations of things going on. If we don't defend and talk about the whole scope of the UN's work, who's going to in our communities? So I'm gonna ask our award-winning colleagues from Houston, Tita said she'd come up here and do a role play with me. Tita, come on up here. I voluntold her to come on up here. She's a good voluntold person. And she's gonna come up, we're gonna talk about this issue real quick. So let's learn from Tita. We haven't scripted this, we didn't rehearse it last night, but we're all family. So are you ready for this? Okay, we're in a no judgment zone. Come on up here, Tita. I'm gonna be the big jerk, okay? I'm gonna be the big jerk journalist because I'm gonna brandish the world's most dangerous weapon on the streets of the US today. Do you know what this thing is? It's a recorder, this thing makes people so nervous. There are plenty of scary weapons out there in the world, but for some reason, this makes people so nervous. As soon as the recorder's hot and that red light goes on, you, eloquent spokespeople, smart people, get all nervous and jittery. We're gonna talk for 10 minutes, because I'm gonna get the cane in a second. We're gonna talk for 10 minutes about how to relax, how to talk about the UN message, and some success we've seen from you on how to do this. But I'm gonna go with this big question. Let's move to the side here. A, because I want more space. B, because it makes for a better picture. Did you hear that, Stuart? Okay, so we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna ask her. I'm gonna put my tape recorder on hot. Maybe we're being taped, I don't know, but we're at least being photographed. I'm gonna say, Tita, all over the news today, it's clear that the UN can't seem to get its act together, there's inefficiencies, and it's a big waste of US taxpayer money. How is it that you in Houston think that this is worth anyone's attention, given the headlines on Syria, for example, or the fact that everyone agrees that the UN can't do, can't do anything right around the world? Well, first of all, I, I guess I need to make some corrections in the information that you've received. Uh, the UN is doing incredible work in the midst of the Syrian crisis. In fact, 
the peacekeeping uh, efforts that are going on, the leadership of the UN in terms of just the whole Middle East is very critical or else it would even be worse than it is today. And had it not been, an, if it weren't for the UN at this point, then we would not even have the, the factors that are negotiating, that are talking about it, uh, that are coming up with some type of resolution. So I would, I would welcome uh, the opportunity to give you more information in terms of what the US, UN has done over the years leading up to this point and, and showing what progress we have made, even though it is at a critical point. But keep in mind, this entire year has been a fantastic year of democracy building in the Middle East, and the UN has had a critical role in that. You know, Americans are struggling. They're out of jobs. They're feeling the pinch at home. Isn't this just one more dollar that should be staying at home when we talk about, you know, you're out there advocating for UN funding. How can you do that when Houston is suffering? Houston is suffering, the, the nation is suffering, the world is suffering economically. However, when we look in terms of where are we going to invest our money, just as we talk about investing overseas, uh, the UN has missions that are also helping the US. So members here, just as we help others, we also help ourselves. And one of the best investments that our country can make is in the UN. That's why I'm proud to be part of the 86%. What do you think? How did she do? How did she do? Now we're going to unpack for a minute. She's great. We're going to unpack a couple of things that she did, because we're going to talk about some tactics in a moment. And uh, I, you know, it's, it's reasons like this that I just think it is so good to be part of it's so good to be part of this organization because we've got great spokespeople. You are amazing spokespeople, you're authentic, you know what you're doing. First of all, first thing that happened, we're gonna talk about some tactics. Uh, the first one is that you're, you need to be in control and be yourself. Tita was absolutely in control of the interview. Did you hear that? She wasn't ruffled by me, I was being a jerk. And I said a lot of negative stuff. And what we hear people do, and I'm gonna be honest about you and everyone who works with our campaigns, we hear people do something a lot that I wanna invite you to stop doing, and we're gonna model for you, and it was modeled for you a better way to do it. Whenever anyone says something negative about the UN, we tend to repeat it in the answer. So this is what happens, okay? I'm gonna use myself as an example. Aaron, is it true that you're overweight? You know the answer, I have a good fork, I like to eat, I know what I'm doing. Why would I answer, in the, why would I repeat in the answer, it's not true that I'm exactly overweight, well I might be a little bit overweight, I might be kind of overweight. Now you've heard, heard the word overweight how many times? Four times, and I was three of them. So if I'm not trying to highlight that, if I'm trying to highlight the other svelte parts of my personality, why would I repeat that? When you're talking to the media, if there's an allegation that is negative made about the UN, I'm not asking you to ignore it because the journalists will think that you're full of baloney. I'm not asking you to be disrespectful or start a debate, but you don't need to in any written statement or in any comment to the paper continue to repeat the allegation. For some reason, we like to do that. She refuted it, but did you hear her repeating the negative words I used? Tita did not repeat the negative words I used. She did not. Now, when I asked her the economic question, what did Tita do in her answer? I said, isn't it true that in Houston, people are hating it, it's hard, we're in tough times. What's the first thing that Tita did in her answer? She acknowledged, she acknowledged who said that? Yeah, she acknowledged it. So there was a bond, she's not hiding from the truth. She then immediately pivoted to that important point that actually Gillian made earlier today in our meeting. That point that it's in US interests. It's in US interests economically, and it's an important investment. She didn't call it an expenditure or an expense. She called it an investment, which was an important word. You're in control, and we want you to be yourself in these interviews. We want you to know what I call your safe place. In any, in any interview situation, you're going to get ruffled. The conversation is going to turn to things that you don't know about. The other day, I was in an interview, and someone started asking me about human rights in Southeast Asia. I know this much about human rights in Southeast Asia today general stuff, but I'm not an expert. And I got ruffled. And I needed to take the interview back to what I wanted to talk about. I was trying to talk about Rio plus 20. And so while I was not an expert, I was able to bridge the interview back to where I was because I knew what my one message was. I remember those four messages we talked about earlier about why the UN was important today and why it mattered to people where I lived. We want you to make sure that you're focusing on your message. What is the most important thing you're doing when you're answering a question from a journalist? Is to get across your point. We want you to answer and be respectful. But as your mom and dad told you when you were young, like my mom told me when I was young, 
No one can force you to say anything you don't want to say. So make sure that you're focused on your message. The third point before we get to our conclusion is I'm gonna invite all of us to start using our wine glass. What in the world does that mean? I'm gonna tell you right now. I don't drink, but I use my wine glass. I'm gonna tell you all about it. Little experiment. Someone took my stuff here. Little experiment. What happens, what happens when you're hearing this noise right now? What's about to happen? Oh, you're not a fun group. Pay attention, maybe. What else happens when you hear that? The waiter comes? No, have none of you been to a wedding? <laughs> what kind of group? Patrick, who are these people? What is your name? Queens, okay, and Queens, they're fun. Because this means there's gonna be a kiss, right, at the wedding, good for you. Yeah, and you also know that there's gonna be a pay attention. But all of you had your ears perk up because you knew something was gonna happen. As advocates for the UN, and as smart communicators, I'm gonna invite all of us to start using our wine glass a little more. What does this mean? Signaling for the journalists in every statement you write, in every interview you're in, signaling that something really good is coming. Tita did this in her example just now. She used her wine glass. Let me give you a couple of examples. Journalists, again, think they're the busiest people in the world. They're the most important people in the world. They're so busy that you have to help them figure out what's happening. Let's go back to the question with Houston. In Houston, economics are a problem. We're in tough economics times, tough, tough economic times. And I'm gonna rephrase. But what Tita said was, what, you, what people don't realize, did you hear she said, what people don't realize, and all of a sudden I was ready. And as a journalist, I was ready to write. The most important thing to know is, the fact of the matter about the UN's work is, all of these lead up statements are what make your press releases good, your sound bites punchy, and all of your interviews better. And I'll bet in your interview, the, the great article that came out that you're so proud of, where's my friend who had the article he was proud of? I'll bet that in that article, you used one of those words. What are some other words that are like that wine glass that say to the journalist, perk up, I'm about to say something, I'm about to say something really big. What's another example? Despite popular opinion, comma, did you hear what Mel gave us? I was ready, and that's, a, that's an easy sound bite that I can copy paste into my article or that I'll use on my interview. What else? Yes, sir. Listen. Listen. Good for you, listen, because as the viewer, yeah, listen. What, and then something follows on there when I'm with you. Good, sir. For the first time ever. For the first time ever. Oh, that's a good one. If you've really got the facts. I hope it is the first But it's a really important one. Yes, yes, ma'am. New, New research shows. And you know what? The UN is always pumping out research. The, the UN Association is always going to be sharing with you data points. And so you can always use that. New research shows is excellent. And it's always going to get quoted definitely with that 86% number, or anything about the UN's work on children and on health. There was one more. What's another really good one? Yes? Have you heard about? Have you heard, have you heard about is interesting. Good. I think that's going to get their interest, definitely. How would you take that one, and how would you make that into something that's probably going to print? Have you heard about the new initiative okay. that was announced today? Uh, good. According to a new initiative that was announced, have you heard about invites them to get interested? Very good. Bravo. Very nice. Yes, ma'am. We're very proud of the fact. One last one before we move. There's a couple of hands. Sir. What's not, being What's not being reported, what some people don't realize, what others have ignored is, do you understand these points? Those are all points about, and they're in your message. They're in your UN, the friend of the UN message that you carry as a spokesperson. What people don't realize is happening in Columbus is, what's apparent in Houston today is that, and I'll tell you, because I saw when I was in Iowa with, with some of you earlier this year on UN Day. What I hear all across Iowa is dot, dot, dot. Yashar, did that get us print? Every time we used what I hear all across Iowa is dot, 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 that puppy got printed. So please be smart. It's a time-tested tactic. It's not new science. But please help the journalists you talk to by setting them up for a very good, punchy, powerful sound. You, as the best spokespeople for the UN, are able to do that. So use your wine glass. And again, when you see this in the PowerPoint later, please don't report to anyone that we asked you to drink before talking to a reporter. <laughs> That's a bad idea. And as we saw with Tita earlier, we want to make sure that you do pivot with poise when it comes to talking about an issue or an interview that might go astray. Make sure that you're bringing it back to your message. I know I have approximately two minutes for questions. Patrick, is that right? Am I OK? How am I? Two-ish, he just gave me three minutes. I just got a 60-second promotion. 
Let's, I want to take some of your questions, and before I do so, I want to remind you that we're here today, and Renee and Joe, did they leave me? No, there's Joe right there, and Renee, Renee right here, you're Cracker Jack communicators. We love hearing what's working. We love promoting what you've gotten in print. We love hearing what your problems are, so please find us after. We're here to talk to you, and we're here to, to, to communicate with you today. So we'll start with a couple of questions. Is that okay, Patrick? I'll take a couple of questions, yeah. Uh, about messaging. Uh, the, uh, the new uh, uh, folder that we've received today, uh, uh, the United States and the UN in the 112th Congress, a briefing book update. Uh, it's a great piece of work, but it's got some messaging problems. Uh, and so I thought I would <laughs> twist the uh, conversation to that point. The, um, starting with the cover, uh, you see this uh, uh, big white guy in a military uniform uh, supposedly helping a little black kid, uh, which I think has got a, a, a lot of uh, problems. Are we looking at a in peacekeeper? I, I can't see it on my glasses. On. Are we looking at a peacekeeper? Okay. And, okay. and in addition, uh, I suspect strongly that that's a picture that was taken in Haiti, where the UN, in fact, brought cholera to the country and never admitted that it was true. Uh, so, so there's a problem on the front page. And in the pictures, many of the pictures inside Although the text is great, the pictures are very heavily about military operations by the so, U.S. So, so good feedback. Let's, as you look through this briefing book, I think what we'll do is we'll take back that sort of feedback to find out what works for you and for your constituents, for your members, and those images that resonate most with you. I know that, that um, I'll speak, for example, just on the Haiti issue, I know that those were very powerful visuals for a lot of people. The idea that if, if the U.N. weren't there, who was going to be able to help out in the time of Haiti. So visual cues are important. I'm glad you, you raised that with us. And, and Patrick, we'll take that up right after this, and we'll, and we'll get your feedback on those briefing books uh, as we go into to second and third printings from. Thank you. So a couple of questions. I think we're here. Yeah, hi. All right, thank you, Aaron. Um, I'm coming from the United Nations Association in Boston, and I think that this presentation was great, and I really love hearing the examples from specific chapters. And Good. I was wondering, um, do you have your PowerPoint, the examples that you highlighted for us, is all of that collected in a toolkit of sorts that we can take back to our chapters and actually do this type of media training yes, with our members? Because that would be my dream. Yes, ma'am. You, ooh, you, you have, you, that's your dream? Well, then they're gonna make your dream come true. Well, we can find that person, make right. your dream come true, we're gonna right. be fine. It's all on that shiny little thing that you got earlier. But all of this, all of this is gonna be sent to you, I believe, because it was made in real time. And uh, more importantly, we're here for you, and, and these are things, go ahead, and on that website, that beautiful new website that was unveiled today has these materials. This PowerPoint is something we'll share with leaders. If you'll promise, what was your name again? Caitlin. Caitlin, I'll get in big trouble if people think that I told you all to drink wine before an interview. As long as you don't say that point, everything else is shareable with you, as long as you, under, you explain the wine glass part. It's all for all of you to share. And we're here, and we want to interact with you and dialogue and talk with some, with, with each of you. I love hearing, every time I hear Patrick and all of our UNA, uh, team talking to people. I think messaging is always a good conversation. So let's do that. We'll take a couple more questions, right? We'll go here and here. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Hi, I'm from Chicago. Hi. And um, I have a question about the 86%. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that study was conducted by the UN Foundation. Um, I've, many, many years ago, I worked in the congressional office, and whenever an organization um, conducted the study, I'd always, my first question would be, well, are you um, being biased? Are you just looking for what you want to see? Good for you. And Good. Fair I, question. When I want, to go, I have one Republican senator I have to visit, and I would just like some suggestions on how to handle that. Oh, I wish I could come with you. That'd be my <laughs> dream. So fair question, right? She asked a fair question, which is why in the messaging you're gonna find the following. I'm gonna give you the on the record and then the off the record answer, because I think you need both. The on the record answer is it was conducted by a bipartisan polling, a, a group of bipartisan polling firms. Together, they brought us the data. So we use that term bipartisan very carefully because it's important that people know that. The off the record with friends point that you can make, because I'm not sure this is everything I think we'd say completely publicly, but they're well noted national bipartisan polling firms who have clients that you've probably heard of, like John McCain. So we went to real, the, every year we want to make sure it's bipartisan polling, and chances are if you're going to talk to a member of Congress, they will have heard the name of that firm, I promise. Okay, so, so do you have that purpose. available? That is available in the name of that firm, in the press release that's available on the website, okay. that's all there. And, we, and the reason for that is important, 
because if we had just done the polling ourselves or an internet poll, I wouldn't trust it either. But we decided to use that, those, that firm because it means something definitely in Washington, and we can stand firm that it's bipartisan solid polling. Great question. Thank you, Thank you for asking the question. Ma'am. Hi, my name is Kathy Horvat. I'm from Utah, which is the basis of my question because my representatives could care less how many people in the United States support the UN. And I would like to know if you have data now as to how many people in Utah support it, or if not, I would suggest you take some of those red states and do some of those surveys because I, there are a small group of very loudmouth people who are anti-UN, but I would be willing to bet if you asked a cross-section of the people in the state, and I'm from the reddest state in the country, that you would find support for the UN you don't expect. Good question. I'm going to come back. I'm going to take two more questions, and then I'm going to answer all of them in, in a round. So I'm going to go one and two real quick. Oh, everyone, everyone who's standing gets to ask the question. You've been given dispensation. Okay, we're going to go. Let's go here. Uh, hi, Aaron. Uh, I'm Yashar from Iowa UNA. You showed a graphic earlier of the country where uh, advertising was being done. I was curious, if moving forward, if our chapters and divisions can get an update when there is going to be advertising so we can capitalize on those unique um, advertising opportunities. And just very quickly, uh, someone mentioned earlier, uh, be ready for Syria. We've had to deal with that a little bit in our office. And one of the things I put out there is that uh, the UN's World Food Program has ramped up food aid from a quarter million to 500,000 uh, people. And uh, I posed the question, if the UN wasn't there providing this food aid, who would? And that usually works very well for us. Good, good point, good question. Thank you, sir. Yes, I wanted to thank you so much. This was a very interesting presentation and a lot of us have been wondering how the UN, UNA and the UN Foundation is gonna raise the profile of the organization across the country, and I think you guys have got a good start on it. I noticed the public service advertising that you're able to get, and I know it's hard to buy advertising. But I was thinking one way in which the chapters might be able to benefit is if the foundation or the UNA headquarters could send us out a monthly uh, kind of theme or op-ed piece or article that we could then place in local newspapers. Because I think to be effective, sometimes if you have everybody kind of singing the same song across the country, it might generate more impact. And uh, I think the role of headquarters is so good with Congress that if they share some of that information with the chapters, then we can amplify it locally. And I was wondering if you're planning to do that. Good point, there's something to talk to you about on that, on that very point, I'm glad you raised it, because it means more people have that question. Yes, ma'am. Mine was in the, was in the same, exact same vein. Um, and so while you know, 86% of the people support the UN, my guess is that 96% of the people have never heard of UNA. So I think we, need, we do need to um, raise the profile so that you know, people know that there's a way that they can connect with, with the United Nations. So ha what tactics do you have you know, that would allow us to do that? Great, good question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, we have the Chinese Candidates Forum for the presidential elections and congressional elections that are coming up. Do you have questions you can suggest that we can ask the candidates? That's great. I'm gonna start with this audience. last question. Okay, because I think that's important. Thank you, ma'am. I think with that last question, I think we do have, in the, in, even in the advocacy toolkit, correct, Patrick is, is, is nodding, there are those questions available which can be taken at the national level or at the local level for candidates. So thank you, great point, because the question itself is getting your branding out there. You said no one's ever heard about the UNA, potentially, but if you ask the question, I promise you that's a way of building your brand locally, not just with the advocate. That entire room of people in the forum will know you existed, and you need to proudly ask the question with words like, what most people don't realize is dot, dot, dot. Make sure that, that that question moment, make sure you ask it. Make sure someone is taping you asking it. <laughs> because the fact that you asked it is good fodder for us. And we can spit it back out. So you ask the question, you tape yourself asking it, you tell people that you asked the question, and you put a statement out on the fact that you asked the question. And if the answer was good, let's use it. So thank you for that point. But I think that's a great example. That, now that is not a, a story in the New York Times, but by gosh, by golly, we're gonna get traffic out of the fact that you were at a candidate's forum asking that question. Let's go to a couple more of these. Um, thank you for asking about how we can share messaging and use that messaging. And I think that your chapter leader update is a great source for that. Because in that piece, you're gonna have a message queue about what seems to be a mega or an important theme for the moment. You're gonna have an example of what's been used in the media recently. And I believe you're also gonna be able to tailor it using the template for an op-ed that's in your toolkit. Because that template allows you to copy paste, and I promise you, if something's coming from UNA or the UN Foundation, you can feel very, very confident about copying and pasting that information. I don't know, I know the Vice President of Communications of the UN Foundation, 
personally, and I know the executive director of the UNA, and I don't think we're gonna, we want you to take messaging coming from our sources, and we want you to use it. So I think that chapter leader update, anything else we should be mentioning, the chapter leader update, things that come out of, uh, any, anything that's coming on the UNA website that's UNA content, I think it's important that you do, that you use and recycle well. Someone asked about the, uh, the outdoor advertising. It's so expensive to do, which is why we asked for any time a billboard's gonna go blank, we said don't let it go blank. Come and let us fill that messaging. That's hard because we gotta catch as catch can. But we are devising a nationwide uh, campaign this year with some of the outdoor advertisers. We'll let you know. When we are devising big media moments around Real Plus 20, around a summit meeting, the UN General Assembly, around Women's Day, we'll let you know. Because those are pieces we want you to take. And again, in your toolkit, there are banners, there are advertisements. You should be asking the same thing of your local papers. It kills me every time I see a blank ad in a newspaper or where they've clearly put in filler. Do you know the filler? Advertise with us or subscribe here. That's filler, that means they didn't sell an ad. Why aren't you asking your newspaper editors, why don't you take our message? It's feel good, it's up with the world, and it's pretty, and they didn't have to do it. Those are four winning things that for an editor says, hey, it's done, it's not offensive, I'll take it. Offer that out. That's what we've done on a national level. And let's see what happens. And let us know, give us the feedback. And my friend from Utah, who, who asked the question, the Utah question? I just came back from Utah. I've got some saltwater taffy stuck in my teeth back here. I was just there, I had a, a great time in a state I love. This is the place monument, looking over at that beautiful state. I agree with you that there are people in that state, a red place, that really care about the UN. I think we're gonna hear later on today about not only what you're doing as a chapter, but how certain campaigns have moments in your states. And I think we're coming to Utah. I know we are, and I think that's a moment for us to help you do that. In Utah specifically. I think that we can take the nationwide data for sure because it's bipartisan. Right. On state, le on, I don't think we have the state level data, but um, I don't think that's anything we've got uh, at our disposal. Let's, I don't, let, let's take the question back. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Thank you. I want to thank you for allowing me to be part of the UNA family since I was 14, but most importantly, I want to thank you for being successful spokespeople about the most important thing going on today in this country, in Washington, D.C., and that's the fact that we're all part of helping the UN build a better world. So thanks to all of you.